Hey everybody, this is Alex Nugent of Gnome Inc. and this is AHA Computing in a Nutshell, an attempt to make this comprehensible for the rest of us. So why AHA Computing? Uh, wh why do what it is that you're doing? Uh, effectively, one word, uh, that's intelligence. Uh, now this has been defined as the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skill. And uh, I mean, really fundamentally under the hood, intelligence is about learning. You know, the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skill. Uh, I mean, that, 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 that's learning in, in a sense. But you could also um, think of it as learning and inference. So the ability to acquire information uh, about the world, perhaps it's probabilistic, um, some information is reliable, some information is partially reliable, and then inference is the ability to combine all these bits and pieces of um, disparate information together in order to come to a conclusion, you know, ideally an, an accurate conclusion. Now, if uh, intelligence was a car, then learning and inference would be its engine and transmission. This is the meat of intelligence. And the prevailing view is that intelligence is an algorithm. It's a set of equations or a procedure, and uh, the engine uh, for achieving intelligence is uh, our computers. And uh, because uh, computational uh, power, calculations per kilowatt hour, has been increasing exponentially, uh, that we will eventually have computers that will be able to execute uh, our intelligent algorithms uh, to a point where we can compete with uh, you know, our own brains. Now the problem with this assumption is, uh, is that it glosses over this fact, which is our computers, the fundamental building blocks, uh, change over time. We move from one to the next to the next, and every time we do, it introduces slight changes uh, in our architectures, um, and it's mediated or, or is precipitated by physics. We, we hit up against a physical barrier. Uh, this is uh, an example of this would be in sort of the latest wave of um, exponential improvement, uh, basically Moore's Law and transistors. So we went from bipolar to CMOS. Uh, this move was precipitated by physics. Um, you know, our, our heat flux uh, just got out of hand. Uh, we made a switch to CMOS because it was a, it was a more efficient uh, technology. We were able to scale it better. And so we did, and then we marched on and kept on going. Um, but we're, we're hitting up against limits right now. And, and the problem is that, you know, our current digital computing platforms are billions of times less power and space efficient than biology uh, for synaptic operations, for intelligent functions, those things that, that we do, those things that our brains do that we want our machines to do. And when you look at the physics of it, um, it's, it's impossible to reach biologic level efficiency without some very fundamental changes in both our architecture and our underlying technology. Uh, we're not going to get there doing the same thing that we're doing. Smaller, faster transistors won't help us, besides the fact that we're, we're not going to have smaller, faster transistors, uh, at least with what it is we have now. And even if we did, uh, it still wouldn't work. The separation of memory and processing uh, digitally computing synaptic adaptation and integration is a profoundly uh, bad idea um, when it comes to making something efficient. And you can point to uh, lots of data. Um, look up the adaptive power problem uh, or go look at the power consumption of real world systems. And you know, some people will say, well, GPUs, they'll save us. Um, no, they won't. Um, that's maybe a factor of 100. Um, over CPUs, and the only reason GPUs are so fantastic right now is because CPUs suck so hard. Um, but GPUs also suck pretty hard. Um, now we're going to get better. Uh, you know, we're we're going to create ASIC chips, um, application-specific chips, uh, focused in on on um, you know successful learning algorithms, and we're gonna we're gonna get better. But there's a limit. If you insist on separating memory and processing. Uh, if you insist on 
having your, your voltage um, above a certain level, uh, you're just not going to get to the levels of efficiency that biology can get to. You're not even going to come close. So we have, to, we have to change things a little bit. We have to think a little bit differently. Okay, so if, you know, if we're comparing biology and traditional uh, computing to cars, uh, effectively, if you give each the same amount of gas, biology could circle the planet and uh, traditional computers would go about an inch. Okay, this is a phenomenal difference. Okay, this really, uh, this drives to the heart of practical intelligence. Um, you know, if you build a AI system uh, and it takes, you know, the Three Gorges Dam worth of generators to power it, um, it might be as intelligent as a human, but it's practically worthless, right? It doesn't, it, 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 you could pay somebody um, far less. Right, you have it has to be efficient, um, and our the discrepancy in efficiency here is massive. And I know it seems like our computers are amazing right now, but they're not even remotely as amazing as they could be if we just looked at biology a little closer and we looked at architecture and we just we we changed things a little bit. Um, and you know, I'm not the only one who's saying this. Um, just recently, uh, the White House has announced the nanotechnology-inspired grand challenge for future computing. And, I mean, effectively, they're doing what it is that I've been saying we need to do, which is create a new type of computer that can proactively interpret and learn from data, solve unfamiliar problems using what it has learned, and, this is the key part, operate with the energy efficiency of the human brain. Okay, now, everybody likes to say human brain, but what they mean is biology, right? Any biological brain. And uh, solving that problem opens up a massive universe of possibilities. What we're going to be able to accomplish whenever we actually look at the efficiency of our um, intelligent machines uh, and we hone in on that, uh, what we're going to be able to create is going to be truly phenomenal. Now, uh, you know, the DoD is all over this, as you can imagine. Uh, you know, one of their primary objectives is, uh, is to achieve autonomy. Now, autonomy requires that you carry along your processor uh, with you and power it. And, uh, well, when you have a mobile device, power consumption is a big deal. So if, if you're trying to achieve human-level intelligence and you need a gigawatt, it ain't going to be autonomous. Um, it's not even going to be useful. Right? So other uh, departments, uh, the Department of Energy, um, National Institute of Standard Technology, DARPA, IARPA, the National Science Foundation... Um, and a whole bunch of uh, private um, foundations, organizations have all jumped on. Uh, this is a serious problem, and uh, there's this amazing opportunity if we solve it, right? So, wow, we need to think differently, and uh, thankfully I'm not the only one saying this anymore. So what we need is uh, what I call effective intelligence. So effective intelligence is what you get when you basically... Um, divide algorithmic intelligence by the energy consumption of the algorithm. So, just to give you an example. Okay, let's say we have Bob Biology over here, and we have Charlie Computer. Now, uh, Charlie Computer is nice and slick, um, and uh, you give them a, you ask them a question, and they give you the same answer. Okay, we've achieved parity with uh, with our algorithmic intelligence. Uh, now imagine Bob charges you a dollar for his answer, uh, and Charlie, the computer, charges you a million dollars. Now this may seem outrageous, but this is, a, this is about what it is right now. Um, you know, companies like Google, like Facebook, like these big technology companies. Um, you know, one of their recruiting tools is to say, well, hey, you, you're gonna, if you're a machine learning developer, if you're a data scientist, come work with us, we have the data and we have our massive supercomputers that you're going to need to do it. And it's true. Um, right now, you need that computing power in order to, to tackle these problems. And, uh, well, it takes a lot of money. These supercomputers are expensive and they gobble up energy left and right. Uh, so, you know, what has more effective intelligence? Well, you know, Bob Biology has significantly more. Um, it gives you, you know, the same quality answers, but it costs much, much less. That's what we're after. That's, that's what really hits home in the real world. Um, whenever we deploy these things, that's what's going to change the world, um, like nothing else.
right? We're, we're really impressed with ourselves right now. When I say we, I mean, you know, the world at large, uh, for finally being able to tackle some of these machine learning problems and showing um, some of the phenomenal results that are coming out. Um, and, well, it's, it's a result of the fact that we finally have enough computing power to demonstrate it, but we are so far off. Now, imagine if we could actually solve these problems efficiently at the level of biology. And uh, I, think, I think people don't realize just how far off we actually are. We have so many orders of magnitude to go. So, AHA Computing seeks to maximize effective intelligence by considering both algorithms and physics of implementation at the same time. Okay, so imagine, you know, this, this line this here, this is effective intelligence. Now there's, there's a, a local minima, and that is basically achieved uh, via machine learning uh, algorithms with modern digital computers. Um, the act of calculating digital calculation is expensive, and uh, you can search the space of mathematical possibilities, and you can arrive at uh, algorithmically very intelligent solutions, uh, but your implementations will consume a whole lot of energy. And uh, if you don't pick your algorithms right, that's it. You're not going to get any more efficient. You're not going to be able to map it to analog processes or physical computing. Um, you're going to be stuck. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do with AHA computing, is we're trying to tackle both of these at the same time. Can the algorithm be implemented at the hardware level um, and uh, do it at the same time, right? Um, take those constraints together. Okay, so doesn't this make the problem harder? Uh, you know, a lot of people out there, a lot of the machine learning practitioners will say, you know, hardware is, is an optimization step. You know, we have to find the algorithm first. And with all due respect, um, you're full of it. Because there is no guarantee that your algorithm can be implemented at the efficiency of biology. Uh, actually, it's very unlikely that it will be if you don't take that into account. Okay? So, you know, take it into account. But doesn't this make the problem harder? No. It doesn't make the problem harder. It makes the problem easier. And it's very simple why. All right? So imagine this is the space of all mathematical descriptions. Okay? Within this space is the description of, of our universe, but every other possible physical universe and things that aren't even physical. Whatever. Any mathematical equation you could write down. Right? This is immense. Okay? Now, this little green circle this is the space of all mathematical descriptions that describe a physical process. This is you know, I'm showing this is fairly big here, but it's infinitesimally smaller than the space of all mathematical descriptions, okay? It's much, much smaller. Now, within that space is the space of all mathematical descriptions that describe a physical process that can also be practically realized, okay? So, what we're doing is trying to take what machine learning has come up with, a lot of these various algorithms that all accomplish the same thing, and interpreting them in light of circuits that we can actually build and physically realize, and using that as a constraint to hone in on a much, much smaller search space, okay? So reducing the search space makes finding the solution easier, not harder, okay? Now, of course, the caveat here is if your constraints are valid, right? If our assumptions are correct, if it is possible to reduce machine learning to a physical description, um, and implemented in our technology. If that is the case, then it's going to be easier to solve the algorithmic problem of what is intelligence by taking those constraints into account because our search space is radically reduced. Okay. So that said, what you know, why aha computing? And the answer is simple. It's because we are searching for effective intelligence. Okay, not algorithmic intelligence, but effective intelligence. We want something which matches the primary performance, accuracy, you know, peak F1, the things that machine learning people uh, talk about, um, while also matching the energy efficiency, the things that the machine learning uh, community currently doesn't report on, the fact that their simulation required weeks and consumed megawatts. Okay, that 
doesn't fly. If we're going to change the world, and machine learning is, is going to do that, we have to make it efficient. We have to make it so much more efficient than it is now. That's what AHA computing is about. Search for effective intelligence.